If you want Colts talk all year long, you're in the right place. Fires upfield into the end zone. It is caught. Jelani Woods. Touchdown. He's going to fire upfield. It's broken up. Tip picked up. And intercepted by the Colts. This is the official Colts podcast, giving you an updated look at what's new with the horseshoes. Colts have it. Interception. Two seconds left. And the Colts are going to win. In the Indiana Union Construction Industry Radio Studio, let's get the podcast started. Football is back. So are we here on the official Colts podcast. Thanks for joining us on the Colts Audio Network. The gang is back. Casey Vallier, J.J. Stankovitz, and we are on site. I'm Matt Taylor. Welcome to sunny Graham Park, the host of Colts Training Camp 2023. The Colts have been here every year since 2018, minus the COVID year of 2020. We're brought to you by WinBet. Colts reported today. We heard from several players talking with the media. Jelani Woods, the Forrest Buckner, Ryan Kelly did something with the media. Kenny Moore, among others. Chris Ballard spoke to the media. We'll recap uh, what he had to say in terms of breaking down all the storylines on this team going into camp. But, J.J., I mean, the vibe is here, man. Football feels like it's back for the first time since they lost to the Texans week 18. Yeah, well, I was walking across the practice field to get to uh, media availability today, and I'm looking out at this beautiful verdant green field with the goalposts. Verdant. <laughs> Look at that word. And the, nice. It's a great word. And all I could hear <laughs> yeah. was mate Tay's voice saying, it's time for another season of Colts football. Everybody, in your voice. Yeah, 2023 football is back. Colts training camp brought to you by Course in Fire and Security. Colts football returns in 2023. And it's, it's like it's the no sl- John Facinda. It's, it's like the slow pan, you know, with the, yeah, like you get the NFL uh, films trumpets in the background. <laughs> the autumn wind is a pirate. Uh, yeah, 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 pretty much. That's, that's how it felt out here. It, it is so good to be back. It's so good to have actual things to talk about. No doubt. Even if practice hasn't even started yet. Right. Like, uh, but it, it's so good to, you know, to see all these guys back here hear from them, hear their their perspective on how things are going to go in camp, how they view their their team, their chances this year. Yep. Um, it's exciting. This is like the, the first day of school. You know, it's one of those things that you bring that up. It, it always brings you back to the fact that everybody's starting at the same spot. Everybody right now has a clean slate. These guys are coming up here. Like I loved Zaire Franklin was asked, you know, you guys kind of come in with very little expectation, new coach, new quarterback. And he said, yeah, I remember one time we were out here at Grand Park. I'm sitting in the cafeteria and we're ranked as the 32nd worst defense in the league, which is the worst defense in the league. And five weeks later, we are the top team in the NFL. He goes, that's the thing I love about this because the NFL is all about narratives and they change week to week. And he is spot on because that's what happens right now. Everybody has a clean slate. You've got, you know, storylines you're talking about, but right now this is the start of oh, it, and yeah. I love that vibe. Yeah, you know? tangent here, but, I mean, everybody talks about, if you look at the Colts' schedule, everybody wants to break it down. How tough is it? How easy is right. it? Right. I mean, this is the NFL, dude. <laughs> right. We're, we're going to be sitting here in week 10 talking about a game where back in May we said, well, this is a win for the Colts, yes, or this 100%. is going to be a challenge. Yep. But injuries derail a season. Last year the NFL set a record for uh, highest number of games decided by eight or less points. So one score games. Yeah. So all these games, I mean, parity in the NFL, obviously, it, it runs rampant, and uh, it's not like baseball. It's not like basketball. Teams can turn it around very oh, quickly. Oh, very much so. That's mm-hmm. what the Colts are trying to do here, coming off a of 4 12 and one season with a new head coach. Obviously, Chris Ballard talked uh, very in-depth about that today. So we have a lot to get to. Plus, later on in the uh, podcast here, we're going to be joined by Michael Pittman Jr. going into year number four, get his thoughts on on a fresh campaign, but um, some housekeeping items, all three draft picks uh, that had yet to sign their rookie contracts going into camp this week. All of those guys are good. They're on board. They ink their deals. They're in place. They're ready to go. Those players would be Anthony Richardson, Blake Freeland, and Juju Brintz. Also today, the team officially made it uh, official with the signing of free agent defensive end al Kadeen Muhammad. He's back with the Colts. He was here in Indianapolis from 2018 to 2021. He was with the Bears last year, reuniting with Matt Eberflus. So he's back in a familiar situation, at least from a geographic standpoint. New yep. defense, obviously, under Gus Bradley that he's going to have to uh, uh, come to grips with. But 
Earlier today, as we said, Chris Ballard, J.J., met with the media to discuss some of the bigger storylines surrounding this team going into camp. He met with the media for about a half an hour, uh, a lot that he got into there. I mean, some of the bigger notes that I jotted down, uh, he talked about Shaq Leonard. He talked about Anthony Richardson, obviously. Talked about Jonathan Taylor, the offensive line bouncing back, some of the position battles, his disappointment with Isaiah Rogers. A lot that you can go back and yep. listen to with uh, Chris, the full press conference is available now on Colts.com. But for you, JJ, what were some of your bigger takeaways from what Chris had to say? So I think the to, to start, he's pleased with the the work that Shaq Leonard has put in. And I think the the headline here is that Shaq Leonard is not on going PUP. to start on PUP. That's 100%. enormous. That's enormous. That means he has passed his physical. Right. Now, that doesn't mean he has been cleared for contact yet. But Chris Ballard said that that is still going to be a process. We're going to bring him along. But that Shaq Leonard has passed his physical and will not start on PUP. That is a that is an important note. And is going to be practicing. He's yes, going to be participating in individual drills. They're going to ramp that up. Honestly, I can only speak for myself on this, the two of you, but I, that's more than what I thought we were going to hear today Agreed. regarding right. Shaq. That, that's, that's more of an encouragement than I thought we were going to hear well, today. Well, and guys, guys get put on PUP. You know, and then sometimes they get taken off after a day. Sometimes yes. they get taken off after yep. a week. Sometimes they're on for the entirety of camp. Shaq last year started on PUP, and he wasn't uh, activated or he wasn't removed from it until I think it was back when the Colts got back to their facility after training camp was over. So um, I would take that as encouraging news. I don't think anyone, and I don't think Chris wants anyone to read into, that means he's going to be ready for week one. The Colts still are not putting a timetable on on when he's going to be game ready. But in terms of it being an important step forward, that is probably my, my number one takeaway that I heard from Chris Ballard. Today. Yeah, and also in terms of injuries there, two guys are going to be going on PUP mm-hmm. from a newsworthy standpoint. Those players would be Tyquan Lewis coming off his injury right around the start of November last year, the same injury he had in 2021 with that uh, patellar injury. Will Mallory, the Colts rookie uh, draft pick out of Miami at the tight end position, he had a foot injury during the spring he's going to start camp on PUP Chris did said that Taekwon Lewis is getting close probably mm-hmm. a couple weeks out Mallory close to getting back maybe not as long but we'll see on that and and the other thing for people who are listening to this if it comes out that more players got put on PUP those are the only ones that Chris was able to share with us because the Colts are still going through the physical correct process yeah. uh, with the the guys who are in the building yeah. right now some other things that we do know Juju Brintz according to Chris Ballard he's going to be limited early on in camp due to that wrist injury that he had at the end of his uh, final college season coming out of K-State. Drew Ogletree has been cleared, but he will be limited early on in camp, so watch out for him uh, trying to match the same production and excitement and, and dynamic play that he had this time last year in camp as a rookie. Michael Pittman Jr. is going to be limited early, although he did talk to the uh, media today. He said he's very confident about his hip injury. Uh, he participated in the offseason, which we're going to hear uh, with some guys, gathering of players that they galvanized themselves to get together in Miami. So he said, according to uh, Pittman himself, that he was full go, no limitations uh, with, with that back in June and July. Jelani Wood says that he's good to go. He missed some time in the offseason workout program in the spring. So that's kind of the injury rundown for the Colts going into the first overall practice though, Overall, though, I think so far a pretty encouraging uh, yeah. bill of health to start training 100%. camp. 100%. Absolutely. You're not going to have everyone. I don't think any team – is ever going to have all 90 guys be ready to go. Um, but, you know, especially with, you know, Shaq, again, as kind of that headliner there, that he's going to be out there participating in individual drills. Um, it, it all feels generally encouraging in terms of injuries as we start camp here. And one of the things I took of it, when we watched OTAs, we, we talked about how the defense appeared to be, you know, a little bit ahead of the offense, and it was in part because you saw all of the skilled players that were not being able mm-hmm. to be out there. So when this press conference happened, I was anxious to hear who of those guys would still be limited. And, and I, you know, maybe some of those guys might be limited, but they're going to be out there. They're going to be taking those reps with Gardner Minshew and Anthony Richardson, because that is so important right now. I mean, you hear all these guys talk about how important that relationship is and that bond. So that's one of the things I'm very encouraged, that a lot of those guys that did not participate in OTAs, we did not hear that they're going to be starting on PUP or that they're going to take a lot of time to get back into that full, you know, ready-to-go mm-hmm. mode. So, All right, let's talk about Anthony Richardson. Chris Ballard had a lot to say about his first couple of days in camp uh, in his acclimation as a rookie saying that Anthony Richardson 
really is wired to handle all that comes with playing quarterback in the NFL, both on and off the field. Said he's a very stable person. He's had talks with him in the offseason leading up to uh, training camp. Knows Richardson's going to be kind of a a week-to-week thing in terms of what he can handle. And there's really no set criteria on when they're going to know if and when he's ready to play and if he's going to be the starter week one of the regular season. But Chris said he's going to lean heavily on the coaching staff, what they're seeing, and and how much they are able to kind of take in and notice what he's able to process. I thought it was really interesting that Chris Ballard knows this is a very fluid situation. There's no timeline. We're not going to back ourselves into a corner on this decision. So Anthony Richardson, really, when we come out here, we're going to see everything that Chris Ballard is seeing in real time for the first time. And and that's, the you know, one of the questions that I think Bob Kravitz even asked was, how do you know? And Chris was honest. I, I don't think you ever know. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's when the bullets so, fly, when it's When the bullets different. fly, it's different. And, and that's the thing. You know, you, you've heard the only way for him to get better is to get out there and play. You got to be smart. You got to make sure that when he is out there, he's ready to take those. I think everybody seems to be saying the same thing and on the same page. So I don't know necessarily if it's for sure week one, this guy's going to be out there. But everybody, I think, is on the same timeline with in order for this guy to really get a good evaluation of everything we've seen off the football field has checked those boxes. It sounds like he's got the mental makeup. He's got the, 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 the habits to study and practice and everything's there. You just got to know what you have on the field. Everybody seems to be kind of on that same page that you got to get him out there and you don't necessarily know when that's going to be, but it's I a think feel. it's I, exactly. It's going to be the feel. Here's the thing is like, Everyone's always asking, oh, when is he going to play? When is he going to play? Is he going to play week one? The Colts don't know yet. Right. Yeah. I mean, like Chris Ballard saying in his press conference, like, you, you can do everything you need. You know, you can you can see how he operates. You can do all these. But once you get him in live action, that's when you're really right. going to find out. And he's like, even in 11 on 11 at training camp, yeah, he can't get hit. completely different. Yeah. You know, you get him out there in 11 on 11 in preseason games, he can get hit. That's going to be important. Right. It, it, but it's also going to be important out here in the practice fields because he's going to be facing – more uh, probably exotic coverages and fronts than he's going to face in a right. game. So it's all important, but we, uh, he hasn't even had a training camp practice yet. Right. We don't know. You can you can sit here and guess, but you know until until Shane Steichen and Jim Bob Cooter and Cam Turner and Chris Ballard and Jim Irsay and, and this entire organization gets their eyes on him over the next month or so, you're not going to know what who's going to start week one. And the other thing too, Gardner Minshew. Hearing Chris Ballard talk about Gardner Minshew and basically just like he's he's so competitive. Yeah, he's wired to be the starter, yes. but he's yeah. being a good teammate at the same time. That that yeah. line that that Gardner has towed of being competitive, believing he's the guy, but also acknowledging that Anthony's here and we're gonna we're gonna work together to be better. Um, it, if you need to start Gardner Minshew, you're gonna be good with that because as Ballard said, every time Gardner Minshew's taken the field, he's been good. I mean, we've, shoot, we've seen it here. Yeah. 95% completion percentage, fourth <laughs> highest in NFL history yes. against the Colts. So <laughs> you, we know what he can do. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I'm, I'm not sure if you ever really know about Anthony Richardson. Right. I mean, he, could, he could have a great camp. He could have a great preseason and fare very well in those joint practices against the Bears and the Eagles. And it's still just – those are just benchmarks along the way. Right. Those are just barometer tests. And until you're out there week one against one of the best defenses in the NFL, by the way, week one against yes. the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jaguars. Yes, preseason and joint practice, th- those are going to tell you a lot. But again, until those live bullets are, are flying around you and you have to make decisions and the, you know, I hate these cliches, but you know, once the red light's on and the camera's on and it's for real and you're playing for keeps, right. uh, you truly just do not know. So we'll see how that uh, all plays out with Anthony Richardson starting tomorrow, the first day of practice. Colts.com slash camp to download your free tickets uh, all month of August long here as the Colts have 13 free practices open to fans, but those are flying off the yes, shelf. they already got four of them yeah, sold four, out. Yeah. Four practice dates that are already, quote-unquote, sold out. Let's talk position battles. That was something we were going to talk about. That's something that Chris Ballard definitely mentioned as well. And uh, J.J., I mean, he <laughs> he didn't have to think long and hard about the top position battles on this team. It's tight end and it's cornerback. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, playmaking ability at the tight end position, but at the cornerback spot, it's a lot of young depth and playmaking ability that has a chance to shine right away as rookies and first and second year players. Did did you catch the uh, little story that Chris shared about the cornerback 
specifically Dallas Flowers. Oh, yeah. But I was Stefan Gilmore. Yeah. just kept telling him over and over again, man, this Flowers guy's really it's good. It's a pretty good yeah. endorsement right there. Uh, I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll take <laughs> Stefan Gilmore's word for it yeah. uh, when it comes to playing the cornerback too. position. Um, the, the youth at cornerback does not seem to phase Chris Ballard. And I, I know we've talked about it quite a bit on this show, but there's length and athleticism in that group. Those are, you know, Gus Bradley wants guys, he wants taller corners who have long arms, who've got some speed, some athletic ability, obviously. Um, that th- These guys, these five guys that I think we've sort of highlighted, which would be Dallas Flowers, Daryl Baker Jr., Juju Brent, Darius Rush, and Jalen Jones, they all kind of fit that bill, Yep. right? But the youth at cornerback, it doesn't, it, it never has really phased me because you've got these athletic guys, but... If the pass rush for the Colts is what they think it can be with, uh, you know, Samson Ebicom sliding in at that defensive end position next to DeForest Buckner, but he got Dio Dangbo coming on hot. Uh, you know, uh, Buck today was talking about how good Dio has looked during the spring, how a healthy Quiddy Pay is such a huge problem for teams. If this D-line can be that attacking just pressuring the quarterback, blowing up an offensive line group, that's going to take a lot of the pressure off these young corners to be on an island, to be you know in positions where they're going to be tested quite a bit. So it all is going to work together on that. And that's why I guess like, if the pass rush isn't what we think it is, then I think I'm more worried about the corners because of the youth. But ultimately, you pair that athleticism with a good pass rush, I, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. Also, too, the offensive line, Chris Ballard talked about that. Very convicted that this group's going to rebound. They can play much better than they did last year. A fresh voice coming in in Tony Sperano Jr. And Casey, Chris also hinted that at the end of last year, they were they were good. They did not play as bad as the narrative – swirling around them would suggest. They, they played good. Ryman's going to take another step. Uh, Chris talked about how good of a spring that he had, how much that he grew mentally, and then also physically. We've talked about that in the yeah. past. Bernard Ryman looks, looks the part right sure. now playing left tackle and taking over that, that position. They're going to continue to look at the O-line to see if they need to bolster that, but he's happy about their ability to run the ball at the end of last year. And I just think more so than anything, just convicted that group is going to run it back and be in a good spot with a new scheme, a new quarterback. And I think those guys have a big chip on their shoulder, giving up those 60 sacks and just not playing up to their collective standard that they set for themselves from 2018 to 2021. It's something I've talked about the the, the entire offseason. As I've been bullish on this line, I think that it really – you look at like I look at Bernard Ryman and the way he played the last half of the year I think was very very serviceable as a left tackle and that was his first time doing it and ultimately he's still young at playing that position that he's going to continue to grow and it looks like he's got that mental makeup to take those necessary steps to get to where he wants to be as a you know a really good left tackle in this league and I, I, you've seen good play out of guys like Ryan Kelly, Quentin Nelson, Braden Smith. You get all of that together, you throw in, you know, you talked about the offseason Will Fries had. He was very glowing about the offseason he had. So I'm right there with him. I think this, this group, the five that we saw in the year last year, if that's the five that's out here, I really do like the way that that's going to look. And, J.J., he said during the draft, like, there were, there were guys they liked – it just didn't come up on their board to right. be in a position and to draft those you, guys. I mean, Chris also understands what's being said and what the narrative is. I mean, he understands, hey, I'm running it back with a group that allowed the second most sacks in the history of this franchise. Right. He understands sort of the gamble, if you want to call it that, with all pro players like Quentin Nelson and Ryan Kelly and Braden Smith. Time's going to tell who was right about this decision to keep this core together. And, and here's what... I, I, and Chris has echoed this, and, and I've talked about this. Is like the offensive line in the second half of last season really was not the disaster that the first half of the season you know made it out to be, right? Like if you turn on the tape, the offensive line was better. They weren't great. They weren't you know no no one's confusing them for the the best group in the NFL, but they were they were good. They got the job done. There was consistency in who was on the field, right? And. Bernard Ryman, I think, you know, the, you look at, obviously, the, the sacks everyone's going to remember, but on a play-to-play basis, he was solid. He got the job done, especially in the run game. And the the discussion about, like, should you have added, should you have not added with the draft always goes back to you can't reach to fill a need. So if you're sitting there and you, you're you looking at Blake Freeland, Adetami Wadabare, and then maybe a guard 
who you have lower down on your board. And you're like, we got these two fourth round picks. We really need a right guard. Let's reach for this guy. Then all of a sudden you don't have maybe Adetama Wadabara, who the Colts think can be a really good player as a three technique in this league. The, you just you have to be able to stick to your board and get good players in and then trust the guys who are still in the building. Yep. So, uh, you know, and, and look, there is always a, uh, a risk that you need to go out and make a move between now and the end of camp. But that's something that the Colts have always looked to and always said we are okay doing that. They've done that after the draft when yeah. everybody said you got to go get a left tackle in the draft. You know, they, they did that uh, a handful of years ago with Eric Fisher. So right. definitely a fluid situation there. Michael Pittman Jr. is coming up on the podcast here in just a few moments. But before we get to Pitt, I do want to close with this in terms of the discussion on the day. Every training camp, there's always players, Casey, that have something to prove, right? Either coming off a down year, trying to make the roster, scratching and clawing, living up to expectations, living up to the pressure that, you know, the internal expectations uh, have set for them or the external expectations from the fan base have set for them. Give me a player on this team. I'm putting you on the spot to a degree. But a player that has something to prove for whatever reason – in this camp going into the uh, 23 season? I'm going to go with Julian Blackman. I mean, we, we think he's going to be playing, you know, that strong safety spot. He's been injury plagued his first couple years. When he plays, you see how important he is. This is a contract year for him. This, this is a big time in his NFL career. And I think you haven't seen the full Julian Blackman. And if he can stay healthy, I think he is on pace to have a really big year, really big year for this defense, help him out financially to get a, you know, one of those lucrative deals because I think that's the kind of player he is. So I think Julian Blackman might be my guy when I look at this team who is, is, is primed for if he has a big successful year like he wants to have, I think it could be huge and, for this and team. And Chris Ballard is very high on his ability yes. to make that position switch. Very high on Julian Blackman just as yep. a player and a person, and all, his yes. leadership, but also kind of downplayed – how significant of a move it is to go from free safety to strong safety. Yeah. Those two positions, obviously, in this defense and Gus Bradley's scheme, kind of interchangeable, do the same things based on down and distance and things like that. So Julian Blackman's just a football player. Yep. He's going to be able to handle that, no problem. I'm going to put Kenny Moore the second on this. Ah, uh, yep. Great minds he, think alike on that yeah, one. Yeah, hey, great. It's still yours. Um, <laughs> We we have heard nothing but very good. honest today. By the way, yes, yeah, very yes. candid and humble, and mm -hmm. you know some inner reflection. But there's a lot of stuff that he said that would be hard to admit in a public mm -hmm. forum like Kenny did. I today. think that self that self reflection that he did after last season is really yeah. going to benefit him because he's a good player. He's a good football player. He he we've seen it and. I think he's got the right mindset to get back to being the player that we knew him to be right. uh, You know, from 2017 to 2021 that culminated him in making the Pro Bowl. Um, I, I really believe that out of him. But it's something to prove because he is he is going into the last year of his contract. Yep. And yep. he he's a guy who, you know, Chris Ballard addressed rumors that the Colts would consider trading him this offseason. Uh, you know, he did that before the draft and said, you know, we, we decided we wanted to keep him here. Because uh, he's a good Colt, we want it. We want him on our team. But um, th this is a big year for him to to prove that last season that was that wasn't who he is. Yeah, right. And I think he is very much on the the right track to uh, being able to do that. Yeah, he said in the off season back in the spring, like there was a lot of conversations that had to happen, some deep personal conversations that had to take place in order for him to just stay in Indianapolis because we heard all about the offseason chatter, what his future was in Indianapolis here with the Colts. So great answer right there. Kenny Moore, the second Julian Blackman, players that have something to prove going into 2023 for different reasons. Another guy that has something to prove coming off a 99 catch season and trying to have a huge year for the Colts in year number four, going into a contract year. Michael Pittman Jr. sat down with us a little bit earlier today, talked about his excitement reporting for another camp, going into year number four, working with new quarterbacks, being a dad once again, having uh, his second child in the offseason here in the summer. So earlier today, myself and JJ, we sat down with Michael Pittman Jr. going into training camp 2023. 
Colts football is back. The team is back at Graham Park for another year. Training camp is here. J.J. Stangovitz, I'm Matt Taylor. Michael Pittman Jr., Colts wide receiver, is our guest here at training camp on report day. Pitt, what's going on? Great to see you. That smiling face, that infectious attitude. What are your feelings going into another camp for you? I am just excited to uh, be here and just going into year four. A lot has changed. I feel like it happened so fast. I'm ready to take it day by day and just enjoy it. Off season wise, it, it felt like it felt like a very fast off season with all that that happened surrounding this team yeah. in, in terms of new coaching staff on the offensive side of the ball, new head coach, some quarterback changes. Do you feel like you got in what you needed to get in work wise in the off season in preparation for this uh, first couple of days of camp here? Absolutely. Um, we did a couple of team, well, not team, but player player deals. Like we went out to. Miami, we were doing stuff here, did a, uh, did a couple things like in like California. So uh, we definitely had fun and like we got work in and things around here have been a constant change and you just got to roll with it. Keep rolling. What were, what were those player or, you know, player led things like who, who showed up to them and, and what were you guys doing? Yeah, so we had a good turnout. I mean, I would say 90 percent of our offensive skill players were able to go and then and then other people have things pre-planned and right, stuff. Right. So like you can't expect them to drop everything that they had. But we had a very good turnout. Um, I was very happy with it. It all went well, you know. You know, we did walkthroughs, we did routes on air, we uh, we did like play study. So mm-hmm. it went better than I expected it to go, you know, because I've never really helped plan something like that. You know, it's always been up to somebody else. So so it turned out better than uh, what I hoped. That's kind of you taking on a leadership role in year four. I mean, you're you're a vet in that that room now, yeah. in that skill position room. Absolutely. Um, we got a room full of young guys that. Uh, have a lot to prove and I think that they're hungry I think that they're ready I think that they're going to show people that we're not what everybody thinks we are Mm -hmm. you know you know that we're more than that Michael Pittman Jr. is our guest what were your big takeaways just from the install of the offense and getting to know Shane Steichen and how he is as a play caller how he is as a head coach in the offseason just the groundwork that was laid in the spring going into the summer here yeah I would say the offense is very similar to what it was my rookie year. Okay. Um, there's a lot of similarities, and Shane just brings a different energy. Um, him being one of the, like, younger coaches, um, you kind of expect younger coaches to be those offensive minds, you know, the McVeighs and the Shanahans and, and, like, those guys, you know, like they're, like, dialing it up. So I think that you can expect that from him. What about just how he – he kind of handles things in the building and yeah. the expectations he has for you, you know, at every moment you're in the facility or you're up here at training camp. How, what sort of impression did he leave on, on you with that? Absolutely. We have our Colts team pillars and uh, he kind of lives by those and and uh, he kind of demands everybody to follow the same rules and it keeps everybody on the same path. It keeps everybody uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, I mean, I think that's great, like, for, like, our team because, like, in the past, I mean, we may not have had great accountability. Mm -hmm. um, And he's really sticking to that. So we just got to stick to that from from week one all the way to week 17, and then we'll see what happens after that. How much does that matter? Is that a huge thing? Can you notice that? Can you you see that manifesting itself in the locker room? Absolutely. Between you and the players? Absolutely. I mean, that can be the difference between you winning a game and like losing a game because if you don't do everything you need to do consistently then you can't have consistent production when it's crunch time Mm -hmm. so really preaching that i think is actually the most important thing actually yeah it's michael Pittman jr with us let's talk about you where do you think you have grown the most from your rookie training camp can you remember back three years ago just Mm -hmm. how you felt going into this setting for the first time and then how much more comfortable you are now as, yeah. a, as a person as a player as a father just the, the growth uh-huh. that you've had in, in three short years here yeah I mean my first camp here I mean my heart was racing I was scared I didn't know where I was going everything just happened so fast and it's like intimidating because everybody's yelling at you this way no this way that way run this play you have to get up and sing like in front of the team for <laughs> every single <laughs> offensive meeting um so I mean I was spinning and and now this just feels like my like regular life you know what I'm saying right. like just like I'm showing up for my fourth 
camp and right. I'm ready to go and I'm excited for it and um, it just feels like it's what I do now. And you came in during the COVID season. Exactly. So talk yeah. about a, a major curveball on top of everything else that you were dealing with. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So we were the peak so we were the peak COVID class of 2020. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Well, for, for Alec Pierce, you know, you went through that experience as a rookie. He, he probably went through it last year. Mm-hmm. For him, what have you seen out of him as, you know, now things maybe aren't spinning, they aren't going as fast. You're maybe not scared to get up and sing in front of your teammates, you know, yeah. just for him going into this second year camp. I'd say I'd seen his confidence improve the most. Because he was always confident, but, like, there's a different confidence that you have when you get in the building and, like, you know everybody's name and everybody Mm -hmm. knows you and you just feel more, more, like, comfortable. You feel more, like, at home. So just seeing that transition, I think that that's going to help his play because sometimes when you're not comfortable, like, it's hard to play well. The more comfortable you are with the offense, with, with, like, your teammates and your staff, um, I think the better that you can play. How do you kind of impart some of those lessons then on Josh Downs, a rookie coming in here? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I just show him love. Like, I'm not that guy who's going to mm-hmm. come in and, like, hey somebody or talk down on them because they mess up uh, because that's not how I wanted to be treated, like, when I was in that position. So I'm just there to build those young guys up. Um, and when they make a mistake, you know, like I'm going to correct them, but not in a demeaning way. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then just protect them from like other situations that that like could create that negative that negative reaction from right. like an outside person and and just kind of coach them through the ups and downs and and that and that you don't want to read everything they say about you and, and you don't want to believe everything good they say. You don't want to believe everything bad they say. So to just stay consistent. It's Michael Pittman Jr. with us. There's no doubt about that. I think this is our first opportunity, at least us anyways, our first chance to talk to you mm-hmm. about Anthony Richardson and Gardner Minshew and the new quarterbacks coming into camp this year. Well, what, what are your, your feelings and impressions of those guys working with them for the first time in the months of April and May? And, and how, how much of a head start do you have going into this camp because of your work with those two guys? Oh, yeah. So I actually didn't get a chance to work with them during OTAs because I uh, sure. wasn't out there. But just in for our, a good for a good reason, yeah, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Your your yeah. second child is born. Yes. <laughs> So for our dead period is when I really got to work with them and and just seeing both of them work. Well, really, all of them work because Sam, too. So Mm -hmm. they're all just so dedicated. I mean, they're fierce. I mean, competition. I mean, they're out there and everybody is still in good spirits, but they're like competing out there. You know what I'm saying? Like one throws a deep ball. The next one's trying to throw a better deep ball. So and that's kind of what you want to see. Like you want to see that head to head competition, but everybody still still like keep it light. Right. You know, because we're all still teammates. So. Um, I'm excited for uh, all of them, really, and um, I think it's going to be an open competition, and 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 we'll see what happens. So, like, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I'm not the coach. They ain't told me nothing. <laughs> so, you know, like, I just work here, right? So I'm excited to see what happens throughout camp. But for you as a wide receiver, to when you talk about that competition of, like, these guys are going head-to-head, but it's, like, it's, it's friendly. Your teammates, yeah. you're trying to make everyone better. What confidence does that give you that whatever the coaches decide – for week one, that's going to be the best quarterback because they competed and and really grew throughout camp through that competition. Absolutely. And I think even after that, I think that they're going to keep pushing. It, just because one guy is named the starter, I mean, we've seen it last year, right? right. I, mean, I mean, I mean, things definitely change, and, and they change at any position. Mm-hmm. So they're just going to keep pushing each other throughout the whole season, and I think that's going to make everybody better. Yeah, you played with six different quarterbacks, though. This is going to be seven, mm-hmm. regardless of who it is week one, either that's yeah. whether that's Minshew or, or Richardson. How difficult has that been for you in your career to you want to produce and you want to do everything that you can to help the team but you also have to have stability at that position how how challenging has that part been for you yeah I mean I mean the NFL is constant changing so you just got to roll with whatever and and it does nobody any good to point fingers and be like hey I didn't do this because of that so 
I mean, really, like, it's on me. So whatever I can do is solely from from what I can bring, like, to this team, whether it's Chris Ballard out there throwing passes or yeah. it's or it's uh, Patrick Mahomes, and I just use his name because he's the consensus number one quarterback. Sure. sure. So, so, like, it really doesn't – doesn't matter to me and also the Colts haven't just brought in a bunch of guys I mean we brought in a bunch of very quality elite players from Phillip to Carson to Matt I mean all those guys were in the MVP conversation and then for Phillip and Matt I mean we're talking Hall of Fame Mm -hmm. uh, Hall of Fame guys top 10 everything yeah Yeah. so um, and then and then so so really they haven't just been bringing in anybody and then like we've had a couple of young guys who are very talented you know Sam you had Nick come in here who came in and won a Super Bowl right so I mean like it's not like we're just throwing anybody in there yeah. right you mm-hmm. know like we got like quality guys so. for for you here at camp uh, something that's always stood out to me watching you out here is just how like physical <laughs> you are especially when the pads get on yeah. but you're you're now you're a leader on this team you know mm-hmm. you're talking about organizing these guys. How much do you think that physical mindset that you have can kind of bring other guys along to, like, match that physicality? Absolutely. Um, That just comes with setting the tone. I'm a guy that if I let somebody get away with something on me, like, Mm -hmm. they're going to go do it to Alec or they're going to go do it to Ashton and Josh. So so even if it seems small, I'm going to do something back. Like, just because I think that's how it goes because – um, I am seen as that vet, and if they get or and and if they think that they could do it to me, then they're definitely going to do it to my other wideouts. So and and that's kind of my way of like protecting them is not letting anything slide, whether it's small or whether it's big. Like I'm going to react. Yeah. So so <laughs> and every year, like we have talks about it. Like they're like Pitt, like we need you to, to like, be smart. <laughs> and like I'm like I'm gonna be smart, but I'm not gonna let anything slide. Like nothing slides. Who's having those talks with you? Well, it used to be Coach Wright. So yeah. so I haven't had that talk with anybody yet. But uh, yeah. But I only think that's because Shane hasn't seen it yet. <laughs> so. Well, I'm sure he's seen it on tape. And yeah. But I'm sure from afar he's respecting it. Yeah. And it comes from a good place. It comes from a place of competitiveness and, yeah. and, and deep love and, and care for your teammates and passion for football. Final couple of things with you. The, the core – parts of this offense are coming back and then you've got some key new pieces within this offense as well last year obviously did not go the way anybody envisioned it going how much of a chip on your shoulder collectively does the offense have to to right the ship knowing you guys are obviously capable of, of much more than the output last year absolutely i mean everybody is just writing us off that we're going to be a, a bottom five team or like whatever i mean that's kind of like what we want you know you know what i'm saying like you want teams to be like oh like it's just the Colts, you know what i'm saying and then like we come right through and punch them in the mouth you know so just having that like underdog role i feel like some or that that's something that we could really embrace and kind of take on like that role kind of like how philly did it you know what i'm saying like nobody really really thought philly was philly until they went on this this like sure. 10-0 run and people mm-hmm. are still talking about hey like like Philly's not that good. Like Philly's not that good, and then they keep on going. They go to the Super Bowl, and then and then like they unfortunately didn't win. But I mean, you're in the Super Bowl. Like that's what mm-hmm. we're all like trying to do. And then Shane comes from Philly, right? So so maybe maybe he's bringing that same underdog mentality that uh, they had. And and for you guys, the returning guys from last year, I know you talked about it a little bit in the spring. But how much motivation are you still drawing from the way that season went? Absolutely. I mean. I just think about the feelings from last season, like after it was done and just just like knowing that like I don't ever want to feel like that again. I mean, that was that was by far the lowest I've ever been playing football. So like just knowing that you got to do everything in your power to make sure nothing like that happens again. As long as you can say that you did everything then I think that I can live mm-hmm. with it. But but going back to last year, like as a team, I don't think we like I don't think we did that. Here's to a better 2023, my friend. And as JJ said to close out, congratulations are in order. Big summer for you and your yes. family and your wife. Thank you. Hype it up if you if you don't mind. You're a father of two now. Father What's of it two, like? Thank you. It's it is definitely more difficult, but it's not 
Like, it's not what everybody said it was going to be. I don't know if my two kids are more quiet like than other kids, but. Oh, or, well, that's good. Or, Thanks. Or, Appreciate or that. Maybe my wife, like, just does, like, a great job. but uh, She does a great job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so she makes it easy on I me. I feel pretty bad about myself right now because my kids are, they're loud. They're yeah. loud, brother. Yeah. No, I mean, they definitely can get like that. But I sure. think, but, like, I think my wife, like, just does a great job of managing them, and then I do what I can. So. Yeah. Well, we know who the real MVP is is right yes. we definitely know who Absolutely. that all, all pro within the household that's michael Pittman jr congrats on the family news and best of luck here during camp and uh, we'll talk to you soon thank you guys that's michael Pittman jr going into year number four always a great conversation just a good personality he, just he, a really good dude easy guy to talk to easy guy to root for as we heard casey he talked to the media and then sitting here and talking with us moments ago, he is the leader within that wide receiver room. In, in the past, he's looked up to, to older guys, you know, T.Y. Hilton. These are the guys that are going to organize the offseason training uh, between the mini camp and training camp. Right. These are the guys that are going to get guys to go down to Miami and work out. He's like, that fell on me. <laughs> that, and I, was, I wasn't used to that. And I think that's a big step for him mindset-wise going into this camp, knowing he's got to be the guy on the field, but off the field, he has to live up to expectations of the younger guys have for him as they look up to him. Yeah, no, it, it, it is crazy. I mean, it, I'm glad you brought that up because if you think about it, it seems wild that he is in year four because it seems like, I mean, he's, I mean, clearly he's still so young. I mean, he's, I mean, I'm to that point now where the, the guys that come and go, I mean, they're so young when they come in here. But, I mean, he is that guy that he has taken the strides, the necessary tooling from that wide receiver group, whether it was T.Y. Hilton, and now he still kind of has that guy as his receiver coach and Reggie Wayne who has been in this building, and right. he was a guy who was organizing that kind of stuff back in his day that he learned from Marv. So it's like, you know, that Marvin and Reggie tree still lives on. Mm -hmm. We saw it. So that torch was 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 held so highly when Ty was here, and I'm seeing that same you know kind of fire out of Michael Pittman Jr. Yeah, for sure. No doubt about that. Appreciate his time earlier today. We're gonna have camp conversations with players after every single day of practice. So that this week looks like this. Tomorrow, Wednesday, practice from 10 to 11 here at Grand Park. On Friday, I should double back. Thursday's a day off, yes. so the Colts will practice Wednesday, Friday. Saturday this week. So Friday's practice will unfold from 10 to 11.15, but that's sold out. So you can't get tickets anymore online and download that for Friday. Same is true for Saturday as well. Saturday is going to be a night practice over the weekend, 6 to 7.30. So Tom Petty, baby, those Indiana boys on an Indiana <laughs> night. That's what it's all about up here at Grand Park. That's sold out 6 to 7.30 on Saturday. Sunday is an off day, and the Colts get back to work on Monday at the beginning of next week. Again, Colts.com slash camp to download your free tickets and to find the start times of all of these practices up here at Grand Park. Practice recaps and interviews uh, every single day. Uh, there is practice with our camp chats. Then coming up on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, so starting tomorrow, Colts Daily Updates on 93.5 and 107.5. The Fan, our flagship station in Indianapolis. If you're driving around, tune that in at 6 o'clock. Uh, normally Tuesday through Thursday, but this week, Wednesday and Thursday. And then on Friday, Colts Happy Hour. Yeah. Back with JMV. Conversations with Shane Steichen, Colts players, and also Sam Monson from Pro Football Focus is going to join that show. That is 6 o'clock, 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Casey? Here we go, brother. It's Tomorrow here. it starts. I know your eyeballs are going to be all over the place in about 30 seconds. Where do your eyeballs go first when the Colts break stretching and they're done doing individual drills that first 11-on-11 11 11 period tomorrow? Where are you going to be honing in at? I mean, uh, let's be honest. It's got to be at that quarterback group. You yep. just, you just got to see them because, I mean, you know, whether it's Gardner taking those snaps or if it's Anthony, that's where your eyes are going to be. I think that's where the entire – you know, everybody that's sitting up in the stands, that's where they're going to be. There are a lot of really intriguing camp battles, though, that I'm yep. going to be watching throughout. I love that we have a whole month up here because I can, you know, deviate my time yeah, where I want. Yeah, balance it. But definitely, I think tomorrow it's going to start with that quarterback group and then maybe towards the end of the week, maybe I'll venture into the defense and all that. But definitely quarterbacks tomorrow. Indeed. That's all for us today. Casey Vallier, J.J. Stangovitz. Again, thanks to Michael Pittman Jr. for joining us on the podcast here today.
Be sure to like, subscribe for all the Colts content, all training camp long the month of August. This is your place to be, the Colts Audio Network. And again, tomorrow we'll have a recap of practice and another camp chat with the Colts player up here at Grand Park. We will talk to you later this week and next Tuesday on the official Colts podcast brought to you by WinBet. Until then, everybody, thanks for listening. Be safe. Hope to see you up here at camp. And subscribe, as always, here on the Colts Audio Network. So long.